Dreamcatchers, welcome to another exciting day in the Writer's Haven. I'm your host, V. Helena, and today we are over the moon in presenting our studio guest. Best-selling and award-winning author Marita Golden is here to share insights on writing and her personal writing journey. She's the author of 17 works of fiction and nonfiction, and her debut memoir, Migrations of the Heart, firmly set her on a trajectory of iconic literary greatness. Critically acclaimed, Migrations of the Heart is celebrating 35 years of literary success, and we are pleased to have Marita on the show to talk about her writing career from that point to her latest literary work, The Wide Circumference of Love. Join me in welcoming Marita Golden to the Haven. Marita, welcome to the Haven. I'm very excited to have you here with us, and particularly excited about this anniversary for your memoir, Migrations of the Heart. Um, 35 years, this was your very first book. It exactly. hit the ground running. <laughs> Tell us about that experience and, and where were you before you began this writing journey? Well, I was 29 years old and I had just returned from living in Nigeria where I had been married mm -hmm. and had a great adventure. The marriage did not last and I had been told by the woman who was still my agent all these years, after 30 some years, that even though I wanted to write a novel, I had a great story to tell in the story of growing up in the 60s mm -hmm. against a backdrop of black power and all of the things that were going on. Going to Africa, Nigeria, living as part of a Nigerian Yoruba family, discovering my quote, roots, and then returning to the United States. So she convinced me that I really should write the story of my life, of that experience, and for the time being, put the novel aside. And so it was, I had no idea that my very first book would be a memoir. Mm -hmm. And in those days, uh, what happened is that Migrations of the Heart was part of a whole group of memoirs by women, mostly, that ushered in the idea of stories about identity, women's lives, that they could be really important mm -hmm. contributions to literature. So um, it was a big surprise <laughs> to me, and even more that the book became one that was adopted by universities and colleges and, and meant so much to so many people, so I'm very proud of it. Did you know at the time how impactful the book would be when you were just sitting and, and outlining and just going through the process. Did you have any idea of how 35 years later people would still turn to this book and just see that this, this is a work of art, truly? Well, I w wanted to make it impactful. I always write with very serious intent. That is, I write in order to introduce new ideas, um, to shake up what my reader thinks reality is. And so one of the things I wanted to do in the book was I wanted to chronicle and capture for people who were not there what it meant like, what it meant to be a black girl coming of age in the 60s, getting black, getting loud, getting proud. And I was very conscious that I had to put things in the book that people may not get anywhere else. So I really was documenting my experience. So I only know that it was my intent to write a book that could be considered important. Mm -hmm. And luckily, it was. And how influential were your parents in the writing of this book? Well, my parents were very influential. My father was, in a sense, my very first writing teacher. He was a man who really hadn't, who hadn't graduated from high school, but he was a voracious reader. He read everything, he thought he knew everything, he was a great storyteller. And so my bedtime stories were about Cleopatra, Sojourner Truth, Frederick Douglass. So I got black history lessons. And I learned from hearing those stories that a good story is a narrative that has somebody at the center of it who does something unusual, something different. And very often the thing that they do will change their life or will change the lives of others. Mm -hmm. And my mother was enormously proud of the fact that I loved to write, I was a good student, I loved to read, 
And she told me when I was about 12 years old that I was going to write a book one day. Mm. Uh, and now I was usually a pretty disobedient child, <laughs> but I, I obeyed her <laughs> in that. And so they it. were very important, very important in giving me the confidence mm -hmm. and the environment where no questions were off limits. Uh, they talked to me like I was an adult. Mm -hmm. And it was almost like a little laboratory for, a, for creating an intellectually curious child and someone who could be a writer. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that I have heard from others who have either written memoirs or are thinking about writing them or in the process of writing them mm -hmm. is there's that, that desire or that they, they want to pull back a little bit. They don't want to reveal too much of themselves in their writing, even though they know it's a memoir. I mean, there's the, um, the fictional memoirs even. Mm -hmm that people are doing, so you don't really know how much of that writing is truly their experience or the experience of someone else. Did you have that challenge in approaching this process in your well, first book? Well, I, I changed my husband's name, my first husband's name, uh, and I changed a few identifying um, characteristics, but other than that, I was very honest and I think that mm -hmm. the memoirs that people most relate to and most feel satisfied by reading are these memoirs where they feel that the author has made a contract with them. And we always make a contract with our readers. Mm -hmm. And the contract is, says that you're reading something that's true. Um, now truth and facts are different so that uh, you're really trying to get to the emotional truth of the experience. Mm -hmm. And that's why I always tell my students uh, that when they're writing a memoir, they have to write butt naked uh, because mm -hmm. the reader really does want to know how you felt about what's happening to you. Uh, you can only make the reader feel the emotions of the situation if you allow yourself to feel those emotions, if you allow yourself to feel the pain, the mm -hmm. anguish. And that's the door to healing. Uh, the most moving memoirs that I've ever read have always been um, deeply um, revealing. Now, there's the famous memoir, Black Boy, by mm -hmm. Richard Wright, mm -hmm. in which there was a considerable amount of imagination, shall we say. And he grafted the experience of other people onto his life. But he acknowledged that. He acknowledged in the introduction that he was writing an imaginative autobiography mm -hmm. to give the reader what, the sense of what it's like to be a black boy growing up in the segregated South. So I think as long as you inform the reader, that's fine. Okay, okay. And who were some of the influencers back at that time when you were uh, engaged in the writing of that book? Well, I was very fortunate to be uh, living in New York City in the early 70s. I was a student at Columbia University. Mm -hmm. And to be young, gifted, and black in New York City in the early 70s was a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found really wonderful mentors in uh, the great poet Audre Lorde, the wonderful poet June Jordan, because I was writing poetry at first. And they gave me a lot of encouragement. And uh, this was a great time. I mean, Maya Angelou was being published, Toni Morrison, mm -hmm. the whole generation of black women writers who would influence so many of us were finding their voices. So it was a very, very exciting time mm -hmm. to be writing my first work as well. Okay. And there are so many books that came afterwards, and fiction and nonfiction books. Um, there, let's see, there was uh, one book in particular. Saving Our Sons? Saving, Saving Our, our Sons. Sons. Saving yeah. Our well, Sons. Well, I go back and forth between fiction and nonfiction. Yes. So that I've written about half a dozen novels and the rest have been anthologies or nonfiction works. And so my first book was a memoir and then I did a novel and then <laughs> going back and mm -hmm, forth. Mm -hmm. uh, in the 90s, that really difficult period of the crack wars and the black man as an endangered species, all of that terrible time was a period where my son was an adolescent and uh, he had witnessed, well, two young men in his junior high school were killed in incidents of violence. 
and um, we weren't living in a really tough neighborhood. We were a typical middle class black family, but the violence uh, could touch you no matter where you were. So I wrote Saving Our Sons as a way to answer his question to me. He asked me, why would God let that happen? Mm. So I wrote about raising him against the backdrop of the violence. I wrote about uh, leading educators and activists who were trying to save our sons. And uh, I just wrote about my, so it was very personal, mm -hmm. but it was communal. So I kind of called it a communal autobiography mm -hmm. in which the voices of everybody in the black community could be heard on this particular subject. And do you find, whether it's a novel or a fiction or a nonfiction work, that much of the work that you're writing um, has been impacted or is written because of some life experience that you're going through at the time? Well, like I when think, you wrote Saving I Our think Sons. that Saving Our Sons, certainly. The, the fiction comes to me in different ways. I mean, when I wrote the book, the novel After, mm -hmm. about a, an African-American police officer who kills a young man during a police stop. That was actually the one I was trying to think thinks that of. he has a gun. Mm -hmm. That was inspired by the Prince Jones case, where Prince Jones, the Howard University student who was shot and killed um, by a police officer. So yeah, that I'm often inspired by things that are going on in the world. Mm -hmm. um, when I wrote the memoir, well, the nonfiction book, Don't Play in the Sun, which was about colorism, I wove into that kind of an autobiography of the role that colorism had played in my life. But then I also wrote in the same book about um, colorism in film, colorism in politics. I interviewed black people of all personal <laughs> complexions <laughs> and got them to talk very honestly about this. I, mm -hmm. When I was in Cuba, I, I, I wrote about going to Cuba and seeing so many darker skinned people on the bottom and lighter skinned people on the top. So it's been very satisfying to, to be able to write both personally mm -hmm. as well as um, in a larger sense in the, in the same what I call a communal autobiography or communal memoir. Right, and there was another anthology that you did with someone else um, where you had African American women and white women. Oh, that was called Skin Deep. Skin Deep. Yeah, um, white and black women writing about race. Okay, mm -hmm. and how um, did you engage in, in that? Uh, well, that was a nonfiction. Well, book, that was just a collection of collection of essays. Okay, so mm -hmm. let, let's talk about that for a second because you've done a number of anthologies. Yeah. And I know that you're working on one now and mm -hmm. we're going to get to that. Mm -hmm. But um, at the time that you were writing anthologies that were, I guess, focused on social justice or injustice and you had writers write about mm -hmm. specific topics, mm -hmm. how did you engage in that process? Were you acting as editor? Yeah, yeah. Basically, I mean, one of my favorite anthologies is Wild Women Don't Wear No Blues and uh, black, men, black Women on Love, Men and Sex. And what happened there was this was around the time where the, a lot of the self-help books about relationships mm. were, were getting popular. Okay. And I would go into the store and I never saw anything for black women. So I told my editors, we need a book where black women talk about this. And basically I called up about 12 African-American women who I knew. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm inviting you to a party. Um, we're having this party and it's called <laughs> Wild <laughs> Women. So if, you, if I asked you to write an essay about love, men, and sex, what would you write about? And I just gave them that assignment. And these were all really good writers. Wow. So I was not disappointed by anything. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have to do a lot of editing. So. Um, and that's, in fact, one of my most popular books. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what about Gumbo? Well, Gumbo was a project that we did at the Hurston Wright Foundation as a fundraiser. And uh, because of the way that the, the Hurston Wright Foundation had been playing such an important role in the lives of black writers, we just asked all the writers we could to give us a story, give us an excerpt mm -hmm. um, for the anthology, which was designed to raise funds for the organization, which, which it did. 
Yeah, and Elin Harris was a part of that project. Yeah, Elin was, was great. He was a co-editor okay. with me, and Elin was wonderful. He was a member of the board of the foundation, and he was so generous and, and big-hearted, you know, <laughs> he was really a special person. Yeah, yeah, so let's talk more about the Hurston Wright Foundation and its mission and some of the work that it's done in the community. Well, what I... I, I sort of, once I decided that I was going to really be a writer, I knew that I was also going to be a literary activist. And uh, when I came, when I was living in Boston when I wrote Migrations, uh, and I came back to Washington because I wanted to be around black people. I wanted to raise my son around <laughs> black people. Of course, came back in time for him to see Mary Berry smoke crack. Oh, my but goodness. <laughs> 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 but nevertheless, D.C. was better than Boston in terms of black role models. So um, I started initially an organization called um, the African American Writers Guild. Mm -hmm. Is that, <coughs> are, are they still around today? Okay. No. Um, and for a couple of years, we worked locally with black writers. And then I began to feel that I wanted to have a national impact. So Clyde McIlvain and I co-founded the Zora Neale Hurston Richard Wright Foundation. And um, basically, we, for the last 28 years, have been creating more opportunities for black writers. We mm -hmm. present an annual uh, summer writers workshop, we do public readings, we do weekend workshops, and our big event is the Legacy Award, where we present um, awards to the best published writers in fiction, nonfiction, and poetry, mm -hmm. and we also honor icons of our community, like we've honored Hakeem Adabuti, Juno Diaz, Carla Hayden, mm -hmm. and so, I'm very pleased that after 28 years, the organization has new leadership. Uh, it was very, I don't believe, it's, I call it the Edie Amin School of Leadership. <laughs> I don't believe that I should stay around forever. So it was very important for me to work to create new leadership. And they're now doing a great job. And uh, we have a, a summer workshop coming up mm -hmm. uh, in August and some spring workshops coming up uh, in April. So I encourage people to visit our website, HurstonWright.org. And I named it for Zora Neale Hurston and Richard Wright because they didn't like each other. They could stand each other in real life. <laughs> and the, her foundation was founded at a time when there was a lot, there was a lot, battle of the sexes in the black writing community. Mm -hmm. Black women um, who were writing were being attacked by black men as anti-black male. It was mm. a really difficult time. So when I thought about who would this organization be named for, it was important to name it for both a man and a woman. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the satisfying things is that over the years I met both Richard Wright's daughter and Zora Neale Hurston's uh, niece, who were writers and activists in their own right, and they love the fact that the organization's <laughs> name for, for both of them because they were so similar. Yeah, yeah. They're icons in themselves in their own time and in their work. So what is your process? And, and do you approach your process of writing differently when you're writing fiction versus nonfiction? Just Well, uh, often with nonfiction, yeah, I mean, well, they're, they're very different. Often with nonfiction, I mean, I'll know the story. I'll know what From I want to write, to but um, I still have to do research. I mean, when I wrote Don't Play in the Sun, okay, I, I was inspired to write that by India Ari's song, oh, yeah. uh, Video, mm -hmm. and Brown Skin. And I knew, because I'd experienced colorism, but I still had to do research. I still had to talk to people. Mm -hmm. um, and very often, even when I write a novel, I'll do loads of research because I'm often writing about people in a world that I know nothing about, people in situations that I know nothing about. Mm -hmm. So then I have to do all this research and write as though I've experienced it. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's one thing I wanted to talk about with respect to the wide circumference of love um, and your ability to interweave a, a, dr a disease that is just destroying lives and families all over. Mm -hmm. um, and how you're able to, from the perspective of the person that's experiencing that devastation, mm -hmm. um, and then those around that person who's encircling them with love and, and trying to help them through the challenge, or at least support them mm -hmm. through the challenge. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so let's let's go ahead and talk a bit about your latest uh, novel and what inspired you first of all to write the wide circumference of love? Well, I don't have any experience of having to care for someone with Alzheimer's, fortunately. And I had been working on another novel, had hit a wall, couldn't go any further, put it aside, and then a couple of weeks later, some of the characters in that novel found their way into a new book, which to my surprise was about a family dealing with Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And so I spent basically about four years writing and researching. Now the research involved reading novels about Alzheimer's, reading nonfiction about mem uh, memoirs about Alzheimer's, and especially talking to families that were caring for someone with Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. talking to wives whose husband had Alzheimer's, husbands whose wives had Alzheimer's, um, spending time in a memory care unit watching people with mm -hmm. Alzheimer's, and really just drilling down into the experience. So it meant also having readers, that is, as I would do a successive draft of the book, I would have two readers, I had two readers. One was the wife of a man who had Alzheimer's, who was in the facility where I was spending a lot of time, as well as a professional who worked with families. She's a social worker. Mm -hmm. And between the both of them, I could always get everything right. So that if I said something or wrote something that was wrong or that was stereotyped or that was that would um, or that was just incorrect about the disease they would correct me and that's why I've been very pleased that the response to the book by people who've read it who are living that experience and people who are researching Alzheimer's has been very right on they said you got it right mm -hmm. In the process of writing it, though, did you find yourself um, writing the story based on the information that you collected, or was it based upon your own writing, um, not, not necessarily style, but your voice? Well, I mean, essentially, even though you're writing about Alzheimer's, the story is a love story. Mm -hmm. It's I'm using Alzheimer's as a way into a love story. The love of a mother for her children, the love of a husband for his wife, vice versa, mm -hmm. so that it's really mostly a love story. Mm -hmm. So since it's mostly a love story, um, I have to tell that love story in my voice and in the voice of the the characters that I've created and mm -hmm. and chosen was that was there any challenge or struggle in doing that at any well, point? Well, I mean, to get the voice of a person who's writing, who's who's suffering with Alzheimer's, was probably the biggest challenge. Uh, and when I first did it, did the first couple drafts, I really didn't do it too well. And my readers said. Mm. And one of them said, you have to remember that when you're writing about a person with Alzheimer's, they're very unusual things that they will do. Many of the things that they will do appear to be, quote, crazy. They're not crazy, mm -hmm. but the things that they do appear mm -hmm. to be crazy. And you can be liberated. You can, be, you can imagine almost this man who has, who's a successful architect, very educated, who now has this disease. You can imagine him doing almost anything. So once I was told that I could unleash my imagination, <laughs> that really freed me. Yeah, and I, I wondered about that as I read the book. And, you know, I, of course, could see your artistry within it. But my focus was more so on the love story. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then I lost, I couldn't hear your voice anymore. Not, and it was just me as a reader just being so engaged in the reading that I wasn't focused on the writer because good okay <laughs> well, I disappeared <laughs> you did that's dis what I want but, I want to disappear but there were times when you would put a line in there and I'd say there she is because you would say things in such an eloquent and artful way well, thank you yes it's all over it's all over migrations of the heart so if you have not read it you want to pick that book up because um, that's just literary genius but so when I was reading this love story, 
And then I, I did see parts of you there, but primarily it was the love story. And I wondered how much of a challenge that was. Well, I mean, there's a lot of decisions that you have to make in a novel. You know, like, okay, if he has Alzheimer's, um, is he going to die or is he going to live for the, for the length of the novel? Um, how is the disease going to affect his relationship with his wife? Mm -hmm. Is his wife going to remain faithful? Um, he's living in this facility. Is he going to be involved with someone? Mm -hmm. um, his son, who's estranged from the family, is he going to come back to the family? Mm -hmm. So that you have all these decisions, and that's one of the and, and the real daughter, challenges. the daughter, yeah. and the boyfriend. Yeah, I mean, there's all these, and the thing is that life goes on, even when someone has Alzheimer's. Life is swirling. Your daughter gets pregnant. She has the baby. Your son gets married. I mean, all these yeah. things swirl. Life doesn't stop yeah. because a person has Alzheimer's. And that's the thing I wanted to show, that life moves on. Even for the person with Alzheimer's, life moves on. And you can see that without revealing too much mm -hmm. in the story. But he's moving forward. Yeah. He's moving forward. Yeah. And I love that you use Washington, D.C. Um, yeah, well, I love writing about <laughs> setting, because I think Washington is a, is a great city. It has an enormous um, history. and the novel covers 35 years. So you see Washington in the 70s, you see mm. it in the, yeah. in the 20, you know, 18 period. So you get the history of, the social history of Washington. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was really important for me to do. Yeah, and you did it masterfully. So what's next? Uh, well, I'm working now on a collection of essays about Alzheimer's. I've become an activist. Mm -hmm. I, I did a big article for the Washington Post Sunday Last Magazine year. Mm -hmm. about the impact on the black community. And now um, I'm working a lot with a wonderful organization called Us Against Alzheimer's. And if you are an African American or a woman or Latino who are really the fastest growing groups that are developing Alzheimer's, they do a lot of work to keep those groups part of the advocacy and part of the research. Mm -hmm. So for anybody who's listening to this or watching this, uh, if you want to know more about Alzheimer's, go to Us Against Alzheimer's, as well as reading my book. <laughs> <laughs> so it's us against Alzheimer's dot org. Dot org. Dot org. Dot org. Okay, great. Well, thank you. The time has just run so quickly yeah, as I you knew for it would, me. but I really, really enjoyed having you on the show, mm -hmm. and I'm certain our dream catchers gleaned a lot from this discussion. And thank you our... for supporting writers in this way. Oh, absolutely. Dreamcatchers, I hope you enjoyed our inspiring discussion with activist, teacher, and 2018 NAACP Award nominee, Marita Golden. To learn more about Marita, visit her website at www.maritagolden.com, and you can also follow her on Facebook and Twitter. If you missed any of our phenomenal season one shows or want to catch up on season two, check out our YouTube channel, Writer's Haven Show with V. Helena, and become a subscriber. And I have some great breaking news to share. Our show is now available on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spreaker, and Alexia. So now there is no excuse for you to miss out. Many of you have seen our social media postings about the Annapolis Film Festival as well. So it's finally here. Catch our red carpet coverage and filmmaker interviews in our upcoming shows. I'll take you backstage to meet nationally and internationally acclaimed filmmakers, and you'll get a chance to hear them speak about their films and their artistry.